Hello, everyone. This is Renee Rentmeester. I'm the creator and executive producer of the Cooking Without Looking TV show and podcast. And today we're very lucky to have Lynn McClellan. Lynn, how are you? Oh, I'm good. I'm doing good today. Having a good. great day. <laughs> well, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you calling in from? I'm calling in from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Ah, okay. And um, you were just telling me that you have RP? Yes, yeah, I have RP. I was diagnosed when I was uh, about 26, and I'm 69. So I've had it. I've been doing this all my life, it seems like. <laughs> oh, wow. So, yeah. so was it slow in, in um, coming on or was it something? Uh, like yeah, in fact, it's been very, very slow. I still have a little bit of sight um, in one eye. I still have a 3% field with 2050 in that 3% field. So I can still see but, you know, I have to scan a lot back and forth to see stuff, but it's incredible the amount of vision I think I still have after all these years. I think it's just, and I still remember way back a long time ago, um, the doctor, um, a year later, they were still trying to figure out, back then it wasn't as common to find out, you know, the diagnosis. And a year later, they were still trying to figure out what it was. And I went to another eye specialist and I still can remember all these years, him telling me that he has seen RP patients that 20 years after they have it can be looking down the street and see a trash can lid 50 feet away. And he says, I bet you're going to be able to do that. And all these years, I've kept his words in my mind and I can still, I can still see things further away. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I think that that gave me the motivation and the determination to to do that, you know, his words, yeah. Well, when, you, when you first got this, um, when you, you first got this uh, diagnosis, what did you think? Um, hold on. Um, I thought, um, well, I was really, um, I, I was pretty, I was pretty upset and disappointed, you know, when I first got it. And then, after it really sunk in what was going on after a while, I was pretty angry for a while. It was really hard for me to accept that, you know, at, at such a young age, and I had two young kids at the time, you know, very, very young, that this was going to happen, you know. You know, like they would say things like at the eye doctors, you need to give up your driver's license, you need to do this, you need to do that. And I did slowly accept it, but it was quite a while before I, before I really did. So it was hard. Yeah. Well, how long did it take for you to give up your driver's license? Oh, or shall we talk about it? <laughs> I, was, I was, I was diagnosed at 26. So I finally quit driving probably at 32. I'd lost enough vision, you know, and I quit driving at night first and then in the daytime but it took a while for me to stop driving yeah wow and um I still have my driver's license because you know all you had to do is go in and walk in there and pay the money and you didn't have to to get it renewed I did that for a while and then I finally I finally didn't do that any longer either so yeah oh wow and then oh. I and then I did things like um uh, inquire with visual services, how to, you know, to get mobility training and things like that. I did that probably long before I really even needed to, but at least I had that, you know, already. And I did it two or three times over the years, you know, to kind of, and then I started finally using a cane. Let's see when, oh, it hadn't been that long ago, really 2011. I started using, or 10, I started using a cane then. And then it was shortly after that, I got a guide dog because I found out the cane and I weren't very good friends, so. Oh, how did that happen? <laughs> oh, I was out, uh, I lived out in the country at that time and I was walking on this sidewalk that kind of had a rough edge and I kind of, my cane didn't hit the spot where I should have been and Ooh. I went off the side of it and almost sprained my ankle and I got mad at my cane and was whacking it. <laughs> <laughs> And then I told myself at the time, I probably need to look into 
getting something else. So I went in, called visual services and asked them if they uh, gave people guide dogs. And they said, oh no, we don't do any of that. So I just got on my computer and I found uh, Guide Dogs of America and I applied and uh, almost a year later, I had a guide dog, so. Oh, that's wonderful. Do you still have a guide dog? I, I have, her, one is retired. She's 12 and a half now. Oh. And I have a new one. Yeah, she's just uh, turned five. Yeah, and I've only had her, let's see, three years in November. So yeah, yeah. So did having a guide dog make you feel any better about your, oh, your yes. sight? Yes, a lot better. I feel so much more confident. And um, when, I, when I'm going places, because there's things that with my cane that I'm not quite sure of sometimes, yet the dog, well, she's a little bit this dog's this dog's a little feistier than my other guide dog <laughs> but, but i still i still trust her a lot to to get me where i'm going safely so yeah yeah whereas i may not trust myself quite as much as i think dogs have a, a sense of uh um especially with the, the quiet cars there are on the streets and things nowadays you know so did you, did, did you have a hard time trusting the dog in the beginning and the other dog uh, the other dog? Yeah, Not we... so much my other dog as this dog. For some <laughs> well, this dog is, um, uh, I mean, we've been through a lot together. The Right after I got her, I got, um, I got a golfer's elbow and I had problems with that and she couldn't work. I couldn't work her very good. And then um, the pandemic started and we couldn't go. There was a lot of places that, you know, you're, you can take a guide dog. We couldn't go, you know, for a long time. Right. And then after that, um, my partner and I have a tandem bicycle and we were out riding our bicycle and we got hit by <gasps> a car and um, I got injured really bad. And after that, I couldn't work her for at least two months, a month and a half or two months. So she's been through a lot and then come back. So she's done, I mean, come back and it's working. So she's doing great. Yeah. Oh, that's great. So, yeah. so tell us a little bit about what you do. Um, well, let's see. Well, I used to be a preschool teacher and a, um, assistant director to a large early childhood center. And then I was also co-directors and that was a pretty, uh, I was in management. I did that for 13 years. I've raised uh, three kids and I have six grandkids. Um, let's see, uh, which are, well, <laughs> the youngest grandkid is seven now and the other one's 23, I think. And um, I had an organic farm at one time. Oh, I was me. Yeah, I, I moved to the country. I had an organic farm, a certified organic farm. I did that for a while. And then we had a huge drought back in 2011. And I realized that farming was a very difficult thing to do. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. My family used to be farmers. My grandfather and my great grandfather. It's, mm -hmm. it, it's not for the faint of heart. Right. My, my, my grandfather on my mom's side was a cotton farmer here in Oklahoma. And then I think that's where I got my love for farming and stuff like that. So, and then let's see, after that, I, um, after I had the farm, I all, oh, I was also still being a preschool teacher. I reapplied for a while. And then I retired from that when I was, let's see, 2011 and then had the farm. And then after that, moved back into town and um, <laughs> let's see. Oh, I've been teaching um, co co my, my partner. Um, we teach com um, nonviolent communication. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but we've done that. I and actually then, had a course in it in college. Oh, did you? In yeah, college? Yeah. Oh, really? Because yeah. it's not taught in hardly any college. Many, many a moon ago, yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> great that it was taught there. Um, and then I founded a nonprofit in 2019 called Compassionate People Foundation, and that's still going. So, oh, tell us about that. Well, what we do is we um, um, teach nonviolent commun communication to groups of people that can't afford to uh, do that, 
like uh, let's say in our nonprofit, we had we were doing it for quite a while before the pandemic with um, some this one man who was a little bit he had taught himself in prison and we volunteered at the prison for quite a while and uh, so we teach it to groups of people like that or uh, veterans or people other people that have disabilities also because those people and then in turn they can go out and reach out in the community and teach it to other people so. and for our audience tell us tell us a little bit de describe what nonviolent communication is for our audience it's a way that people can speak to each other and their needs are they at when their conversation is finished they will feel like their needs are met their needs can be met through their conversation. And there's a lot of conversations, but when people maybe be in some kind of conflict or whatever together that their needs, they, that someone will go away where their needs aren't met, you know, and that can cause a lot of problems in a relationship. So, yeah. yeah Have you found that to work better for you? Do what? Have you found that to, to work well for you? Personally? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And people that have visual problems, can give their self a lot of empathy. There's a, a, a part of the part of it is called self empathy and it is wonderful to do for yourself. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's yeah. interesting. Self empathy, describe that a little bit. Um, well, it's where I would be in some kind of situation. Let's say the first time I ever really practiced it, I went to my mom's house and I had been living with her for the previous year and her and I were not doing real well on our communication together and I walked into her house and sat down and she I asked her what was going on and she was seemed to be really grumpy and the very first <laughs> I did was like I was like I walked out of the room and I said to myself okay you can have this conversation with her what is it you're feeling that's the first step and I thought ooh. I'm feeling worried because I don't know if I can have this conversation. And then I talk to myself about what I'm needing. I'm needing some understanding about what's going on with my mother. And then I make a request to myself and that's to go in there. My request was to go in and have this conversation. So I took a few breaths, calmed down and went in there and had the conversation. And I found out my mom was tired is all it was. She was tired. And and after that conversation, her and I were able to sit and talk together. So it really does work. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. You know, honestly, that happens a lot. People will just, you know, just very human things. And what comes out of their mouth is because of how they're feeling. Yes. You know, they're tired or hungry or whatever. Yes. Yes, it is. And the other person doesn't know this unless they can have a way of communicating with them to figure it out. Yeah. And they may not even tell them either, you know? So yeah, this works really good. Yeah. Ah, that's wonderful. Now you like, uh, we'll get into the cooking. Do you like uh, to cook? Are you a cook or a baker or both? Oh, I'm both. I like to do it all. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, um, I have a garden and all the tomatoes, uh, since we've had a really hot season they're just now all starting to come off of my garden and i'm just so happy I lots of tomatoes i'm like ooh, i'm thinking all the yummy things i can make like bruschetta and i can't wait for all these tomatoes to come off so <laughs> yeah. oh my gosh that's wonderful and what kind of things do you bake oh i like to bake well <laughs> <clears throat> my partner loves cookies so i bake lots of cookies <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's see I can make just about anything cake I can I can make we make I bake pizza I have a, a smaller convection oven that I really like using so uh, especially in the summertime it's not as hot as turning on the the big stove oven so I really like to bake things in it last thing I baked in it was a quiche so oh yeah. You know, I haven't tried a convection oven at all yet. I'm still old school. Well, um, we got it because it has the air fryer. That's the main reason. Ah, uh, okay. I was just going to ask yeah. you about your air fryer. Do you like your air fryer? Yes. Yes. I love the air fryer. Uh huh. Yeah. Especially to make like things like simple things like fries or sweet potato fries or whatever. Oh, perfect. Yes. They come out perfect in that. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, tell us a little bit about the recipe you sent us. 
Okay, I sent a recipe called Moroccan roasted vegetables, and it's basically basically a lot of different vegetables are in it, like eggplant and tomatoes and squash, and I think it has onions. Um, let's see what else it's got: uh, eggplant, tomatoes, squash, onions, um, garlic. Uh, oh, red bell peppers. Um, oh, garbanzo beans. Let's see. Um, um, <laughs> uh, just got quite a few vegetables. And what you do with those is you, uh, you cut them up. Oh, and it, I think it even has a sweet potato. I think that's the other big thing. A large sweet potato, a large eggplant. Yeah. And you cut those up in about half inch slices all those things and like they, they they like to get fancy in the recipe and say quarter them in like little moon shapes but I do good to just uh cut them in half pieces <laughs> <laughs> hey and what kind of what kind of tech uh technique do you use to cut your um, veggies oh well what I like to do and uh, because contrast really helped me with my vision is I have a black cutting board I also have a white one a green one and a light brown one if I'm going to be cutting up, let's say broccoli, I want to use the lighter colored cooking board. Surely I don't use my green one. And if I use the black, <laughs> the black cutting board is great for white onions and uh, lighter colored vegetables. That way I can, I, you know, I can see a little bit. So I, it makes it so much easier when I can tell what I'm doing, you know, and if I can't tell what I'm doing, the contrast just is, is really good. So and then I remember when I am cutting them, um, I know that there's a kind of gloves you can buy when you, you can wear, but I always found it to be real bulky to keep your hands safe. But I just curve my fingers, you know, all my fingers on my, uh, my left hand and then you put the knife up there. And I also have a knife that I really like. It's a different color of knife than a silver one. It's kind of a, a, kind of a, a beige brownish color. And I like it because it contrasts too against what I'm using. So, yeah. So that's the way I do that is to, with the contrast of colors. And that, and then also, there's a lot of spices in this recipe that you put in um, olive oil, like um, uh, it's got cumin and cinnamon and turmeric and um, paprika and um, cayenne, a little bit of cayenne pepper and some salt. And another thing for contrast is I use different color measuring spoons. I use black measuring spoons to measure out the light colored spices like salt and baking powder and all those things. And I have white measuring spoons to, to measure out the dark colored stuff. Oh, so, that's great. Yeah, and that way that helps me to be able to somewhat see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, and then, how did you how did you uh, come upon this recipe? And then tell us the rest of it. Oh well, my partner is the one that told me about this recipe. Um, you just mix the um, the olive oil with the spices, and I I usually do that first. And uh, but when I have a recipe that has a lot of spices too, I always get them out on the all the spices out on the counter first, and then as I use them one at a time, I put them in another completely different spot on the other side of the counter so I may not pick up the same one twice because I've done that before <laughs> it doesn't <laughs> pick the same one twice and then uh you mix the spices all in a small bowl with some with the oil and then you uh, after you um I think you crush up the garlic and put it in with it um then you mix it all together and pour it over the vegetables and toss the vegetables in it and then you put the vegetables out on a, a, a sheet pan or a cookie sheet and bake them in an, I think it's a 425 degree oven and halfway through or 400 degree oven and you, uh, about 20 minutes and then you uh, stir around the vegetables and then cook them the rest of the way. And I believe they cook close to 45 minutes or an hour. And the smell of them cooking is so wonderful because of the cumin and the cinnamon and all those things. Uh, and I've taken them to uh, my family's before for uh, 
a potluck or a dinner and usually there's none left everybody just loves them yeah oh wow even just looking at the recipe when I, when I was seeing those spices I'm like I could almost smell it just reading it oh yeah yeah it makes the house smell wonderful yeah it does <laughs> yeah yeah I love making this yeah oh that's wonderful well yeah. Um, do you have any stories or anything that would epitomize your life as a person, you know, who's, you know, uh, losing your sight or partially sighted? Um, well, let's see. Um, let's see. Other than, um, let's see. You mean like funny stories or? It can be funny. It can be anything. Anything, huh? Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> see um uh how about well this is not really yeah it is it's it's actually a cooking story uh a while back i was baking something and i had a baking powder that was in a big bag instead of a uh, small round container which they come in sometimes but this was a big bag i bought at a natural food store and i had my container of flour white flour and i realized after I'd done it, that I had taken out a cup full of baking powder and oh. instead of the. And, oh and my I, god! And then I, I already added though the sec the cup one cup of flour to that, and then I thought, wait a minute, I haven't added the other cup of flour, and I thought this seems like an awful lot here. Then I realized, oh no, I'd already added. Oh my! <laughs> and that's when I started getting way more organized with my with my um, cooking things because I was like oh this has got to stop you know that you know and if I got through the whole recipe and added that a second cup of flour of course that would have been a disaster what it, you know. oh my gosh <laughs> yeah. well I, I wanted to ask you you said that uh, you know in the very beginning you started to lose your eyes that you were like angry and sad yeah. and everything yeah yeah I was what, what advice would you give to someone who was going through the same thing right now oh Wow. Um, I don't know. I think the it's probably, I would guess if it would be more natural, you know, because I've been slowly losing my sight for a long, long time, you know, and mm -hmm. now it's maybe easier than it used to be, although it still gets really hard once in a while if I lose a bunch of more sight all at once, you know? Sure. So, if I was going to give someone advice to reach out to all those places and people that would help you instead of, and, and try to keep in mind that people that want to help you are there to help you and not push them away. Don't get so mad that you want to push them away, you know, because this, the life does go on. It's not like it's going to stop. And it, it, it it's a lot harder. Sometimes it's a lot e easier to deal with full vision, you know, sure. but it, but there are so many things that you can still do, even though you don't have any vision. There's life is full of things we can still do. So and at the time, it didn't seem that way to me. <laughs> right, didn't... right, exactly. Yeah. I can, but, I yeah, can... To reach out to people. I think a couple of weeks after I found out I was losing my vision, a friend of ours called and she uh, teaches deaf people and interprets for the deaf. And she called me up to tell me that I could use a, a service for it's called the lift here in town. Um, it's not like the lift, a cab service, but it's a, it's a lift that I could, I could apply for and ride on. And that right there, that helped me a lot. And that she called me up and, and told me that she learned I was losing my sight and she, she helped. So that right there helped me a lot. It's to reach out to people. And she, she directed me in the right way, which helped a lot. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Now, if any of our listeners want to reach out to you, how would they go about doing that, Lynn? Um, well, I'm on Facebook, Lynn McClellan. They can look me up there. Um, um, if they want to send me an email, I have a very old email. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have another one. I just hardly ever use it. It's L McClellan, my last name. It's M-C-L-E-L-L-A-N-01 at AOL.com. Oh, well, that's great. Well, thank you so much, Lynn, yeah. for helping us uh, yeah, change talking. the way we see blindness. 
Yeah, yeah, I've, been, I've enjoyed it. It's been nice. Thank you. Oh, that's great. I enjoyed it too. Well, again, anyone who wants to uh, see Lynn's recipe, go to our website, www.cookingwithoutlooking.com tv.wordpress.com and uh, you will find it on our website under the blog section so again thank you so much lynn okay thank you nice to be here okay you take care okay thanks sure bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.